Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 3. Verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I I come before you in the name of your Son. And I know that apart from him, I would have no part with you. And as always, Father, you know me. You know who I am and you know what I am. That I stand in need of grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. I pray that in this day, Lord, you would prove yourself wise, prove yourself strong. In using this day, the weakest among us. Lord, I trust thee that you have been an ever present help for me. And that you have done so for your own glory and because you are love. Father, I will preach a message today that I myself have trouble living. Lord, do not allow me to be in the hypocrisy of making people believe I'm something I'm not. For I know, Lord, there are no such thing. There is no such thing as a great man of God, only weak, pitiful, faithless men of a great and merciful God. But, oh, Lord, if you would provide the power through your Holy Spirit. To change my life through this message. And to make me more conformed to the image of Christ through this message, Lord, I would greatly appreciate it. Help us all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Paul is speaking out of the book of Galatians, a book in which the church is being attacked by Judaizers, legalists. Now, make no mistake about it. There is a need for law and rules and wisdom in Scripture. We have the law of Christ. We have the commandments of God. All these things are true. But I'll tell you something. It is so easy to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. It is a quite different thing to be clothed with the scent, with the life of Jesus Christ. Usually when there is no power of God, we go to rules. And we say, because we do this or don't do that, we're spiritual. My dear friend, the mark of spirituality is the fragrance of Christ in our lives. And the fragrance of Christ in every aspect of who we are as a person. I have spent many, many years of my life preaching the gospel around the world. I have known a measure of success, people would say. But I want you to understand something that that preaching and ministries and great things are not the mark of success. It's the fragrance of Christ on your life. It's the love that you have for the people of God. It's the love. Once I was preaching and after a move of the power of God in a certain place, a lady came up to me and she said, surely you are a man of God. I said, have you ever seen me with my wife? She said, what? I said, how can you say I am a man of God by listening to one puny sermon? You must watch. You must see. You must look. Any fool can preach. But to be like 
Jesus Christ? That's the question of my life. I have got to the point where ministry matters very, very little to me. I want you to know it matters very, very little to me, because if I look in the mirror with accolades hanging off my shoulders and medals around my neck, but I look in the mirror and I do not see Jesus Christ. And I must confess to you that many times I look in the mirror of God's word and I do not see Jesus Christ in Paul Washer. Well, then what does all the ministry matter? What does all the noise and the banging of drums matter? The question for me is this. Am I conformed to the image of Christ? And not just in the realm of church. I know how to put on a show. With my wife and with my children. With your wife and your children, your husband and your children, those around you, those closest to you. That will determine... That will determine, are you clothed with Jesus Christ? This is the challenge. God can win the world. God can do all sorts of things. God does not need me. But he commands me to be like his son. And that is all. And my dear friend, that is enough. That is enough. Now, what does it mean to be clothed with Jesus Christ? And we're going to go back to our principal text now. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 5. Look in verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Now, I want to put special attention just for a moment on something. You are. It is an affirmation. He does not say that the Christian is to become. He does not even say in this point that the Christian is to act like he says you are. What we have to realize today, there's a very important word in philosophy. It comes from a Greek word, ontos. It is ontology. It is the study of being. Today, we are too much about what we do and not enough about who we are, what we are. What am I? Who am I? Am I like Christ? Am I this in my own life? And even before you today, I appear much more spiritual than I actually am. It's not about what I do. It's about who I am. Being in the very depths, the core of my person. It says you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This text terrifies me. It truly does. There, now, we all know of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But at the same time, we cannot deny that throughout Scripture, we are warned to be careful. We are warned to be careful. Now, when this text is usually preached, it's all about doing something. We're the salt of the earth. So as the salt of the earth, we need to get out of the salt shaker. We need to be this influence in the world. We need to do all these things. I would like to submit to you that that's not the contextual interpretation of the text. When you pull a verse out and simply use it as a cliche, lose its meaning. I want us to look at what he's saying. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Now, the point that he is making is this. Now, I'm not a I'm not a chemist. As a matter of fact, I I didn't do very well in chemistry at the University of Texas. But there are certain properties, elements, if you will, to salt. If you take away those elements, you might and replace, even put something better in their place. You might have a fine thing, but you no longer have salt. There are certain characteristics of salt. And if you take those characteristics away, it's no longer salt. So what is he telling us? There is certain there are certain characteristics. To being Christian. That cannot be replaced. 
They are principal and necessary elements of what it means to be Christian. And those things cannot be replaced without making the name Christian without meaning. Now we ask ourselves, well, what are these necessary elements to Christian, to being Christian, not to doing Christian things, but what are the necessary elements to being Christian? Now, this is not how do we enter into the Christian life? We enter into the Christian life through faith in Jesus Christ. But once we're there, what is it really all about? It seems like every week it comes down the pike, some new teaching about what Christianity is really all about. But what is it really all about? According to Jesus, well, it's just laid for us that there are certain characteristics to Christian, to being Christian, that if those characteristics are removed, oh, my friend, as the English say, you might have a fine thing, but you don't have Christianity. So what are they? Now, do we have to just ramble all through the Bible and pick out certain verses? No. Again, context. What does it mean to be Christian? What does God want from you? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I have just described the clothing, the fabric, the fragrance of Jesus Christ. I am so tired of just doing. So tired of having my Christian life reduced down to how I perform and what I do. Jesus Christ comes to me. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he tells me this. It is not what you do, for I can raise up rocks to do what you do and do better than you do. But it is Paul. The seal I have set upon you, the decree and the hope is that you be conformed to my image. That you be conformed. That is what he desires. And I submit to you today that all the problems... If not all, most of the problems in your life come from who you're not, from your character, who you are as a person. Our squabbles in our marriages come from fleshly outbursts. They come from not reflecting Jesus Christ. The problem between brothers, the problem in life, the problem, the disruption of our own conscience, everything comes down from we're not putting enough emphasis where emphasis belongs. And it is on becoming like Jesus. Everybody wants to do something when we ought to be wanting to be something. Now, I want you to look at something that is very important in verses one and two. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, there's something very important here, something extremely important. Have you ever been to Jerusalem? There just aren't a whole lot of mountains. If we were in Colorado right now, this church most definitely would not be called High Point. You're not really sitting on a very high point. There are not many mountains in Jerusalem. Yet Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uses the word mountain. He says Christ came up on a mountain. And why is he doing that? I'll tell you exactly why he's doing it. Matthew was written to the Jews and Matthew is telling the Jewish people. Now, listen to me. The one prophesied, the prophet, the one greater than Moses has come. He's gone up on the mountain. He opens his mouth and God says, this is my son. Hear ye him. 
What Matthew is doing for us is he's saying the one greater than Moses has come with a law greater than the law of Moses. He's not going to lower the bar. He's going to raise it. He's going to raise it. But he's going to raise it. Not in a rule-keeping, legalistic sort of fashion. As we go through the teachings of Christ, He's going to raise it in this way. It's going to come down to one thing. There's an old pastor who... Well, he's not that old. If he hears this message, he'll be mad at me. But there's a, there's a pastor who's been a mentor of mine for years. Now, I know men who have PhDs all over the world and, and everything else. This man pastors a church of about 80 people. God's got His hand on His life like no one I've ever met. And He always tells me this. He'll tell me, Paul, in the New Covenant, love is not a thing. It is the thing. And everything Christ commands us comes down to this royal law of loving God and loving your neighbor and being conformed to the image of Christ, not on a mountainside where it's easy, but in the context of a bunch of people who are not very easy to love. This greater than Moses, this captain of the hosts of God, is now standing before us, the scribe of scribes, the teachers. Let me, let me just share with you something. Jesus makes this quite clear. There's never been a real teacher. Except one. And it's Christ. There's never been a real prophet. They're all types of one greater than themselves. Christ. There has never been on this earth a real king. Except for Christ. Hear ye him. Recognize His voice and hear ye Him. He speaks to you through His Word. But this King is going to come to you with words quite different than you ever imagined. Words that at first will seem almost easier than the law of Moses. And then as you grow, you'll begin to understand these are the most difficult sayings I have ever heard. They cost more for me than the law of Moses ever could. I'll just give you a brief example. Law of Moses says tithe. Law of Christ says if your brother's in need, sell everything you have and give it to him. Law of Moses says give God a day. Jesus said give him every moment of your life. Every beat of your heart that does not beat into the glory of God is apostate. You see how the standards raised? Yeah, we're throwing out all the elementary principles of the law. Because why? There's no need for shadows when the light has come. When the star and the sun have appeared and Christ is both bringing light to day and night. Now the rule is this. Love each other. As Christ loved you dying on a tree. That's why so many people would rather go back to rule keeping. Now, let's look at these characteristics. We won't have time to go through all of them, but maybe um, we'll get through some of them. Blessed. You know, I've studied this word. I, I remember about 150 years ago when I was in seminary, just you know, we had to do this entire Sermon on the Mount in Greek and looking at this word and sitting there with Greek scholars and such. And no one ever could really come up with a meaning. Well, I've got one. It's not very proper. It's not very eloquent. But the term blessed just seems to be God's face Looking my way. Please. That's enough. Why do we think that blessed has to mean all these things? Isn't God enough? 
a dear friend of mine was preaching in Romania and was speaking about heaven. And it was I was sitting there, I cried through the whole message. I, I just I sat there and I go, it's just wonderful because the whole thing was the glories of Christ. That's all he talked about was the glories of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. And when he was done, a man raised his hand and said, this is wonderful, but what else do we get? And I saw that old preacher just his heart just break in two. You've understood nothing. You've understood nothing. Blessedness is God. Looking down upon you. My little boy Ian is three years old. He doesn't do a whole lot right. But when he does do something right, I can be assured he's going to look up. Did you see that, Dad? Look hard because it probably won't happen again. <laughs> Blessedness. Divine favor. Divine favor. This is my son. I'm pleased. Big cars and fine houses and the prosperity teaching is kind of weak in light of just having God look at you with light in his face. Another way you could look at it is to take all the blessings, all the, all the good things of God that come down from the Father of lights, put them all in a bag. And that's what this means. That's what this means. How much blessedness do you and I miss out on? Not because we haven't done ten things to the victorious Christian life, not because we haven't had our quiet time, but we miss out on it because we have not grown in character. We have not grown in conformity to Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor. We don't like that word. We live in the Roman Empire. We brag about Steel and metal, and strength and brawn, and power. Don't tread on me. Pride, wealth, fame, reputation, status. Some of you possibly tasted of that. Doesn't taste very good. Poor, humble, broken, servant, unassuming. Someone you would just pass over quickly. Poor in spirit, what does it mean? Well, let me just read a passage to you that is one of my my little boy says most favoritest verses in the whole Bible. I think I remember where it is. Let's see. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you could build for me? He says, I don't need a thing from you. Now, to some of you, that might be offensive to me. That makes me very, very happy. And where is the place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit. and Who trembles at my word. You see, if it was any other way, there'd be no hope for me. I don't know about you, but for me, there'd be no hope. If he said, I will look to this one, the one with an exemplary prayer life and who knows the word of God like the back of his hand. If he said that, there'd be no place for me to go. If he said the one bold and courageous who can stand against the enemies without fear, again, there would be no place for me to go. If he said the man of great faith, able to believe great things, then I'd have to go somewhere else. That's not what he says. He says to this one, 
who's humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. And, and why is he this way? Because he knows he's not. He knows he's not spiritual as he ought to be. He knows he's not right. He looks at God's word and he says, my failings, my shortcomings, my, my everything about me. And yet faith causes him not to fall into despair because he looks into the face of Christ. I had a seminary student write me a while back and uh, he said, and I know this young man, he's very godly. It seems he's, he's, he's immature like, like young men are, but he's got God's hand on his life. And he, he said, Brother Paul, I'm just so unholy and unrighteous and so ignorant of the things of God. And, and I have the gift of mercy, so I wrote him back and I said, young man, you are much more ignorant and much more unholy than you now know. And he, he wrote me back and said, thanks. I think. And I called him up and I said, listen. I said, I've looked at your life and much of the way you live convicts me of how as an older prophet I have become dull. I said, young man, you're probably more spiritual than I am. We'll know probably about it. But I said, young man, I'm happier than you are. And he said, I don't understand. Now, listen to me. This might set some of you free. Do you ever get up in the morning and you have your quiet time and feel the presence of God and you're studying the word and you seem to God seems to speak to you. And then, you know, you go out and you witness to everybody and you're obedient and and boy, you just you did it right that day. I mean, you were just on top of the world. You, you loved your wife. You didn't kick the cat. You're just you're walking with God and you're so full of joy at the end of the day. And the next day you get up while well, you overslept. You shouldn't have watched that program the night before. You should have been in the word. Uh, you didn't witness when you had an opportunity. And there's a real sense in which you're filled with sorrow. You know what that is? Idolatry. You have become the source of your own joy. Your joy comes from you. And your continuous work. My joy comes from the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be obedient. I want to witness. I want to love my wife. And there is a real sense in which the Holy Spirit convicts me when I do not do those things. But the point is, poverty of spirit is a wonderful thing because when you realize, it's like I used to tell uh, young preachers, I'd say, in order to preach, you've got to have the power of God on your life. Now I tell them in order to tie your shoes, you have to have the power of God on your life. You cannot breathe. Sometimes I get invited to church growth conferences, not very often. But they'll talk about all these great things they're going to do. And, and then I'll, I'll get up and I'll say, let me ask you a question. I go, from where does every breath come? From God. From where does every beat of your heart, from where does it come? From God. Oh, so you characters out here, all you pastors and preachers and evangelists and missionaries with all these great plans. Now, tell me something. You can't even breathe. Your heart will not even beat. Except for the power of God on your life. Apart from any measure of grace in my life, I will be here to you today. Nothing more than a seething demonstration demonstration of egotistical flesh. That's all I will ever be. I was reading through Galatians this morning and I was so convicted. I was reading through Galatians and it talked about dissension and, and disputes, things like that. And I realized that sometimes I do that with my wife. And, and it just showed me. It, it wasn't that, well, you know, I've, we just have a, a problem or we don't agree. The fact of the matter is, I'm in the flesh. I'm in the flesh. And I'm not relying upon 
the power of God. And the reason why I'm not is because I'm not poor in spirit. Someone says, well, I'm poor in spirit. How much do you pray? How much do you tremble? How much do you rely upon the wisdom of God revealed in his word? Poverty of spirit. But isn't it wonderful, church? Listen to me. Isn't it wonderful that you don't have to be something big? Actually, what you have to be is something low. Something broken and humble. Take the back seat. Wash the feet. Be timid and afraid of any task put before you so that it drives you to your knees. Realize when you wake up in the morning that I shall not move to my left or my right one quarter of an inch because without the power of God upon my life, surely I will fall. That's what the passage means in the prayer. Lead us not into temptation. It's a recognition of weakness. And a recognition of a tremendous need of grace. Of grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, what a place. What a place. You know, back when I was a young man, not so much preaching about it anymore, but people used to preach all the time about crowns. You know, crowns. You're going to get your crowns. There's this crown of evangelism. There's this crown of this and a crown of that. I always wondered, would I really want to walk throughout all of eternity with like 400 pounds of crowns on my head? Do you remember when Jesus said the first will be last and the last will be first? When the first is last and last is first, there is no first or last. You draw a rabbinical circle. I am an itinerant Bible preacher. That's all I am. No one's ever going to know your name either. You're not big. You're not Charles Spurgeon. You're not George Whitfield. You're not a great theologian. You haven't swum across swamps in the Amazon to preach the gospel. You're just you. So what does that mean? This kingdom of heaven. Is it a place that you almost ought to dread because, well, there's a pecking order there? You know, there's these big shots. And then there's you. You know, there's all places. There are places that all of us can't go. You realize that. I mean, I remember I was no good at sports. You know, I never got picked for the team. Felt bad about that. There's certain places I don't go because I don't have the reputation. I don't have the money. There's all these places where I'm shut out. There's this pecking order in this world where I always have to take at least fifth or sixth or seventh place or down at the bottom or something. And many people think that that same thing is going to be carried over into heaven. Well, you know, when I get to heaven, I won't even see George Whitfield or Charles Spurgeon or anybody like that because they'll be so close to the throne and I'll just have a cabin on a hillside somewhere. Do you really think heaven is that demonic? The kingdom of heaven brings such joy to me because it is a place where the poor and spirit finally find rest and absolute acceptance. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you finally walked through a door where there's no longer any pecking order and where you no longer have to be anybody and you don't have to score a perfect score or anything else because everybody is only there because of Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be. I had a pastor, a friend of mine one time, he's also a teacher, a wonderful Bible teacher, and he looked at a group of, of us who were young students, and he said, how many of you have been called to preach? And raised our hands. He says, first of all, he says, I'm not the prophet or the son of a prophet, but I can conclude this from your calling into the ministry. There's something terribly wrong with every one of you. He could not have spoken any clearer with regard to me. Broken, 
people. At first you get into Christianity and you think, boy, you know, I need to do this and I need to do that. And well, there are things we need to do. But then you get this idea that, well, the kingdom of heaven isn't much different than the kingdoms of this world. And they've been shut out of most of them. My dear friend, it's not that way. The, the young person baptized here today has the same status and glory as the greatest missionary who ever walked on the face of the earth. I like that. Maybe if you're in first place, you don't like that. But if you're in last place where I usually come in, you like that a whole lot. Freedom from these morbid chains that the world puts upon us and find no place at all in genuine Christianity. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, I can't wait. Well, then don't, because he's talking about now. Amen. Oh, I can't wait till I get there. You're already there. It doesn't mean that because you're already there, there's no trials, uh, no sicknesses, no struggling with finances, no other things like that. It means this because you're already there means this. This is eternal life. You know him now and he knows you. And that is enough. That's not. Blessed are those who mourn. Why are we so in our generation of wanting to have self-esteem? We are so afraid of this word. To mourn. So afraid. Oh, my dear friend. God wants us to be whole and complete, but we will never be whole and complete by molding some false self-esteem in us, we will be molded and complete as we look into His face and forget about ourselves and look to Him. But what does this mean to mourn? Blessed are those who mourn. Let's say that I have a statue of this man right here. A stone. Stone statue. I can walk up to that stone statue and reach under that tender part of the human arm and pinch with all my might. And what's going to happen? Absolutely nothing. Why? He's inanimate. It's a stone. Has no life in it at all. But now if I reach over and grab that man by the back of his arm, that man in the flesh right there, and I pinch with all my might, I am sure we will have a fantastic reaction out of our brother. Why? Living. Mourning could be the greatest evidence of true conversion. It simply means this, a sensitivity to sin. First of all, your own. And second of all, the sin of this sinful fallen world around you. I was preaching a while back in, in Tennessee and some people got sort of angry with me. I preach in a lot of places once. And they actually, these group of ladies and they were leaders, they came up to me and they said, Brother Paul, we're having a real spiritual battle here, just a debate. We're kind of, we're in division and we don't know what really God would think about this. And we just wanted to hear from you. And I said, well, I'll do my best. What's the question? And I'm bracing myself for some tremendous theological question that would probably take hours of study. And they said, we don't know whether or not it's the will of God that we take our daughters to a Britney Spears concert. I looked at them, I said, you're all lost. You're lost and you're going to hell. Now, I said that. I, please understand. I didn't. I said that in a, in a nice way. OK, I mean, I. But the, the fact of the matter is, I said, you have no sensitivity. Sensitivity to sin. You know, one of the marks of true Christianity, according to first John, chapter one, is not that the believer is sinless, but that the believer recognizes sin. Now, let me give you a perfect example. There have been times here 
when uh, when the pastor has preached, I'm, I'm sure because the man who preaches the word of God, when the pastor has preached and the Holy Spirit has been moving in people's lives and begin to deal with people about sin. Is that not true? That's happened. Isn't it amazing? And if there are pastors here, they're all recognized that this is true. Isn't it amazing that when a pastor preaches a message and God begins to do a special sovereign work dealing with sin in the lives of the congregation, it is always the most holy, most devoted and most godly people in the church who come forward weeping and broken over sin. And it is always the most ungodly, carnal, wicked church members that sit back there cold as a stone. Why is that? We're seeing the difference between church membership and conversion. The one thing about a believer is they will be sensitive to sin. Now, sometimes as believers, we can become dull and we will need the rebuke of another and and all sorts of things like that. But in the end, we will have a sensitivity to sin. And God, who began a good work in us, will finish it and bring us to mourning, even if he has to use extraordinary means. I remember it was probably 15 years ago. I was preaching a sermon and I want to tell you uh, it was it was powerful. And when I finished the sermon, a dear brother, an older, older Christian in the congregation, I stepped down and he said, Paul, he looked at me like this, he said, You preach the truth today. And you did it in the flesh and you need to get down on your knees right now and ask God to forgive you because God did not place a whip in your hand to kill the people of God. You know what? He was absolutely right about me. And I didn't see it when I walked down those steps, but I saw it when he told me that. Let me ask you a, a, a terrifying question. When was the last time you wept over your sin? You say, well, I haven't fallen. My, my friend, no one falls. We slide. You say, well, I haven't done the big stuff. Everything's big stuff. Being insensitive to my wife needing to hear I love you and a hug before I walk out the door is big stuff. When was the last time you wept? When was the last time you were broken? When? I can only draw two conclusions if you haven't been. One, you're perfect. Or two, your heart, like mine does many times, has become dull. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, why are they blessed? This is very, very important. And we're going to end here. I was hoping to get through a lot more, but we'll stop here. Why is a person blessed? Now, in the Scriptures, we understand there's a repentance unto life and a repentance unto death. We know that. Uh, Peter had a repentance unto life. Judas had a repentance unto death. Was not mixed with faith and all sorts of other things. But here's the wonderful thing. If you study the prophets, man, sometimes they said things to Israel that literally I don't feel comfortable even speaking about in mixed company. And if you look at it in Hebrew, you're really going to see some fantastic things that they said. Even Paul, the apostle in the book of Galatians, makes a few statements that literally will curl your toes. But here's the wonderful thing about the mark of a true prophet of God speaking a true message of God. He might come down like a hammer. He might burn like a fire. But God will never leave his people without saying this. Come to me. And I will take it all away. Come to me and I will fix you. Come to me. I am not done with you. Come to me. Come to me. This is how the Christian life works. Now, this is about as close I get to a dramatic sermon as you're going to see. You begin the Christian life. How do you begin it? You begin it with a revelation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is revealed to you primarily through preaching. You see God's holiness if you've never seen it before, which causes you to see your sin as you've never seen it before. But... In that revelation, you are not brought to despair because although you see a revelation of God and and his holiness and a revelation of your sin, 
You also see a revelation of the grace of God in the face of Christ and you do not fall into despair, but you run to Christ, the city of refuge. All right. And he makes all things new. All right. Now, after you become a Christian, here's a unique thing that will happen. You will think you're about the holiest thing going. I remember as soon as I became a Christian, I would go out on 6th Street and preach. Man, I thought I was the prophet. Prophet. Muppet, maybe. <laughs> the prophet. You know, and, and I'd look at preachers who wouldn't preach on the streets and all these things and fasting and prayer. And boy, I thought I was just it. Until God began to do what God always does. He began to work death in my life. He began to pull back and show me what I really am. That's why if you talk to a man of God who's walked with God for 60 years, he will see himself as much more unholy now than he did when he first started. But he will be happier now. And this is how it works. As you begin to walk with Christ and you truly begin to, to understand him and understand his character and his grace, you begin to see as you walk with him more and more of the holiness of God. You begin to see more and more of your own failings, which leads you to greater and greater and deeper mourning. But you also see greater, greater revelations of his grace that picks you up higher than you've ever been. And you continue that all throughout your Christian life so that at the end of your days, you are more sensitive over sin. You are mourning greater over the small things that you would have even dismissed when you began. But at the same time, you're happier because it is all in the face of Christ. It is all Christ. Just Jesus. Just Jesus. I had a young man one time, and I didn't want to put out his fire. He said, Jesus is all we need. I said, young man, Jesus is all we have. That's all. Now, I'm not going to give an invitation. This is why. I give invitations, but I'm not going to give one now. This is why I don't want you to take 45 minutes worth of preaching and think that the spirit of God is done with you because psychologically you've left it on an altar. I don't want you to leave it on an altar. I want you to take this home. I want the Holy Spirit to bother you. I want him to deal with you. I want him to be looking back at you every time you see your reflection. I want you to sit down and ponder these things. I don't want you just to superficially listen to this and let it go, walk out the door and go eat it. You know, Ruby Tuesdays. I want you to meditate on these things. I mean, after all, if I had to suffer this stuff all morning, surely you can suffer it for an afternoon. Pray with your husband, pray with your wife, gather your children together. Think about this. Sit silent. The psychologist Jung one time said that hurry is not of the devil. It is the devil. And I don't agree with him because I believe in a personal devil. But he had a truth in there. Your hurried busyness truncates spiritual life. So I'll pray and just ask God to help us because we need help. We need help. Let's pray. Father. Please help us. Help us to be like Christ in the hidden places. Help us to be like Christ among the people who know us best. Whatever it takes, Lord, and it may take a lot, make us like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. The 22 years that I've walked with the Lord and preached, I have seen storms and I have seen times of uncertainty, but um, I have learned that God is always faithful. He's never taken by surprise and that things are ordained of him in the strictest of sense. There's not a maverick molecule in the universe. And I do not trust in the ability of men to hear God, but I do trust in the ability of God to speak to men. That he who began a good work in, in every party here will finish that work. In every party. In every party. If it weren't that way, I would be too afraid to get out of bed in the morning. Well, let's look at Matthew 
chapter 5, we understood in, in verse 13, first of all, that and we're going to read that text again, but we understood something very, very important in Matthew 5, 13, that there are certain characteristics essential to Christianity. And those are the things that we should focus on in our personal lives and that our value in the kingdom is not determined by our activity, but but determined by our union with Jesus Christ. And that's we can do many things, but if we are not conformed to his image, we have not done the best of things. Matthew five thirteen. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would use your word to help us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, I pray that you would grant mercy and grace to strengthen all who need to be strengthened, to comfort all those who need comfort, to be our ever present help, Lord, in our ever present time of need. Amen. You may be seated. I want to take a look once again at verse 13 quickly and then go back to the characteristics which we were discussing this morning. He says something very, very important. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Our productivity in the kingdom of God is directly related to our character and our Christ likeness. One of the great problems I have with with our seminaries today is that we are so focused on knowledge, which is important. Doctrine is extremely important. I spend my life studying doctrine and teaching doctrine. But we spend so much on doctrine and spend even more time on models and systems and programs. But we spend so little time dealing with the character of the seminary student. In the same way, we need to be very, very careful because we are, by and large, Americans. We are doers more than beers. We are those who are active rather than those who sit and ponder the great truths and try to discern the character of our own being. And that needs to change. It truly does. Now, there is a balance. There are people who are always meditating and never do anything. And there are people who are doing things and never considering their actions are the character from which their actions come. And in all things, there is moderation. And in all things, there must be balance. But if I were to look at the church of Jesus Christ in America today, I would say our greatest problem is not that we lack the resources to do things. Not that we lack the models, the programs and the plans, but that we lack conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, no longer good for anything. Do you see how intricately our character affects everything that we seek to do in the Christian life and Christian ministry? Many of you have children. I don't want to run a rabbit here, but uh, I'll say it since I'm here. Many of you have children. You're concerned about what they will do when they grow older. You should be more concerned about what they will be when they grow older. Because it matters very little before the throne of God what they become in this world. Rather, does Christ enter into their lives and are they conformed to the image of Christ? It is all about character. It is all about Jesus and our greatest passion, even our magnificent obsession should be Christ likeness to be like him in the most intimate relationships that we have. Otherwise, what we do do becomes in a great sense, null and void, null and void. 
Now, let me step back here for a moment and say something that's very, very important to say. You may be heard this morning when I said there's never been such a thing as a great man of God. The point that I'm trying to make is there's never been a perfect man. You take a look at Charles Spurgeon, and in my opinion, you'll not find a greater preacher ever walked on the face of the earth. The man. Well, let me put it this way. I was speaking in a conference, a reformed conference a while back in, in Detroit, Michigan, and everyone was there. They, they loved Charles Spurgeon. They loved Jonathan Edwards. They just talked about these men all the time. And, and I stood up and I said, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, was a heretic. And Jonathan Edwards was not as pious as some of you believe. And I went on and on and I began to destroy all their idols. And some of the people were actually getting very, very angry. And then I stepped back and I said, you think too much of men. You see, God does not use perfect men. He uses men. And so when I say that uh, that we need to be conformed to the image of Christ, we also need to recognize that God has always used men lacking something somewhere. And that is why, my dear friend, we need so much the body of Christ and we need to be open to one another and we need to be open to the word of God that comes forth from others. We live in somewhat of a I don't want to say say a state of limbo, but we definitely swing on a pendulum. There is a real sense in which God has done a supernatural, miraculous work in our life, regenerating us, making us alive and making us new creatures. There is another sense in which there is an element in our lives that's yet to be redeemed. And there is a struggle. When I'm seeking for a new missionary on the foreign field, I do not look for the perfect man. I do not look for the cleanest man. I do not look for the man who seems to be able to cross every T and dot every I and just look so special. I do not look for beauty in the man. What I look for is passion in the man. Passion and a desire to do the things of God. You might be here tonight and you might be very, very far away from anything that resembles conformity to Jesus Christ. My question for you is, is there a passion in your heart to be like him? Are you willing to say, I am not like Jesus in my home. I am not like Jesus in my workplace. I am not like Jesus with my children. There are so many places where I am lacking. If you have reached that point sincerely, you're not far from the kingdom of God. There's hope for you. There's hope. Now, let's go on and take a look at some of these characteristics. We've already discussed poverty of spirit, which refers to absolute dependence upon God. And let me say this. A lot of modern preaching today is all about all the great things and pleasant things and lively things that God wants to work in your life. And we have to be very, very careful because I have found that when God regenerates a man, when a man is truly converted, there is a real sense that God will begin to work death in the life of that man. He says in Ezekiel quite clearly, one of the new covenant promises in chapter 36, I will cleanse you from all your idols and from all, uh, from all your filthiness and from all your idols in order to bring you to a state of dependence upon God. He has to blow mighty winds upon you. He has to tear down the strongholds of your own self-confidence. He has to do whatever and will do whatever he has to do to bring you to a point where you recognize you can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ. Absolute dependence. Absolute dependence. Then we talked about mourning. Which for the Christian is not a, a desperate thing. We mourn over our sin, but we're then lifted up and carried on the wings of grace. We know that our contrition will not end in despair, it will not end in condemnation, but the Lord of glory will raise us up. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, He will lift us up. He will. That's His promise. Blessed are those who mourn sensitivity to sin. Let me just say for a moment, step back, because there's each one of these things is a week's worth of study. 
There are certain things in your life. If you're a typical. Church. With typical problems, there are some things in your life that dull your sensitivity to sin. And it's fraternizing with the world. There was a uh, great violinist playing in Europe. And after he played, an old, old man about to retire. And after he played, a young man came up to him and said this, Sir, I would give my life to play like you. And the old man said, I have given my life to play like me. Do you want the Spirit of God to empower you? Do you want the, 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 the favor of God upon your life? Do you want to see God working? Do you want to be sensitive? Do you want to have a quick ear and a willing heart? There are things you're going to have to leave behind. All the things and all the influences that dull your heart and make your ears full of wax. You're going to have to list those things and take them out of your life. One of the greatest problems in the church today is the influence of media and television and all sorts of things that just makes us so dull to true godliness. Church, do you want to be godly? Do you want to be quick to the call? Do you want to be sensitive to sin? It will come at a cost. It will come at a decision. Some of you young men out here, you want to be used of God. Many want to be used with used by God, but few finish the race. Matter of fact, few even start. You'll have to turn away from those things which God despises and run to with a passion the things that God embraces. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. I am a farm boy from southern Illinois. I come from a family of farmers and ranchers, men who boast in their strength. Men who you could suppose if they had a flag, it would say something like, don't tread on me. And I carry that in me. And it's not of God. God calls me, as well as you, to be courageous. He calls us to be strong in the strength of the Lord. He tells us that there are times when we will have to draw a line in the sand and say, you will go no further. There may be times when we have to lay down our life, but at all times we are to be gentle. Sir, do you seek to cultivate this characteristic in your life? Gentle. We speak of the power of our Lord. We speak of the courage of our Lord. And our Lord turns right back around and says, do not confuse me with the Romans. Do not confuse me with an empire of steel. Are you gentle? Do you think that's a womanly, feminine characteristic? Well, it is. But it's a manly one also. Blessed are the gentle. For they, what does it say about them? They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the gentle. Now, whenever we want to define a term, we have to realize that Jesus Christ is the great definer. For example, if I say, if I tell you, you need to be holy. When I say that you People need to be holy. I want you to know there are probably just as many definitions of holiness in this church as there is people right now. The question is, when I tell you you need to be holy, how do we discover what true holiness is? We go to Jesus Christ. And when the Bible tells us that we need to be gentle, where are we going to find a definition of that. Where are we going to find an example? And it is in the person of Jesus Christ. Everything you need to know is found in the person and teaching of Jesus Christ. 
So I want us to look for a moment at being gentle. And I want us to go to the book of Matthew. Chapter 11. Verse 28. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Now, there's something about people who are weary and heavy laden. They're also usually quite intimidated. And afraid. And intimidated. Afraid people. Do not come. And seek help from anyone but the gentle. I always tell men that I'm teaching. I always ask them, I say, how do children treat you? Because that's a great sign of godliness. It's a great sign of the character of Christ. The children, are they comfortable around you? They love playing with you. Sometimes they want to pull you out of the church and have you ride a scooter outside in the parking lot. You see, we had people coming to Jesus that would go to no one else because everywhere else they went, the door was closed. Everywhere else they went, they were crushed even more than when they came. We're speaking about gentleness. We're talking about the type of of character in which those who are weary, heavy laden can come and actually believe they're going to find rest. They're going to find some help. He goes on, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. What an amazing thing. Here's the man that stood against an entire religious system, an entire empire. He would teach those Pharisees and they would get so mad at him that they'd rip their clothes, they'd tear their hair, they'd grind their teeth, they'd throw dirt up in the air. And then he'd look at him and say, you want to hear another parable? He backed down from no one. But at the same time, at the other side of this wonderful personality, this perfect reflection of what manhood should truly be, we see this man describing himself as one who is gentle and humble in heart. People looking at you, coming to you. Would they say that about you? One time I told my wife, oh, what a prophet, my wife. I told my wife, I said, well, that's just not my character. And she said, you're right. You need to repent. That's not the way I'm made, she said, but that's the way God wants to remake you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, so much teaching When in the church today, and this is what's very, very difficult, you need to understand. It is not a hard thing for me to teach you. But it would be a terrifying thing for me to disciple you. And what do I mean by that? If I'm just teaching you from the pulpit, I can say some really good things and you all walk out of here saying, wow, that was really nice. Come live with me. He says, come to me, watch my life and learn from me. Now, there. There is where we find a difficult thing. He's saying, learn about humility by living with me. Learn about being humble at heart and kind and merciful and all these things. You want to know these things? Then come and live in my house. That's quite an amazing thing. I don't know many men, including myself, who would make that statement. You want to know humility? Then come live with me for a while and watch me. Who would dare say something like that? And yet that is the goal for our lives. I remember when I was in college at the University of Texas and also in seminary, I think I made a terrible mistake. I can remember staying up all night. Asking God. God, make me a preacher. God, I want to preach your word. God, I want to have the power of God on my life to preach your word. And you want to know something? At least to some degree, he answered it. I preach all over the world. There seems to be a measure of grace on it. 
I had other friends wiser than myself. And they prayed something like this. Lord, make me like Jesus. I don't care to be a great preacher. Make me like Jesus. Could I have made a terrible error? Yes. Yes. I would trade all my prayers that I've ever made about ministry and preaching. I would trade them all for prayers about conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. I would not feel intimidated at all if you asked me to teach on the biblical view of humility and gentleness. I can do that. I can go through the book of Proverbs and teach you that. What would intimidate me is if you said, Paul, can I come to your house and watch you for a while to learn about gentleness? That would terrify me. I might be able to fool you for a while. I could guard myself. But in the unguarded moment. The real me. Would come out. Now, I want us to look at it. I want us to uh, continue looking at this. He says, you will find rest for your souls. You and I need to be people in a sense where others can find rest in us. They can find a haven. They can find a friendship. They'll see someone who looks past their sin. As Christ looks past ours. Are you a haven for people? I have to be very, very careful here because I want I want to share something with you. To some of you, now this will sound a, a, well, I don't know how it will sound. But I have known people who are very needy. And, and that's OK. But I've also known people in the church that are so needy that everyone else in the church begins to run away from them because every time they approach, it's because they're needy. They're always receiving and never giving. And even unto you, I give this admonition. Not only the strong need to be a haven, but those of you who feel like you are weak and needy, you need to begin to reciprocate and also provide haven for other people. Also give. And maybe in your giving, maybe in your helping others, your problems will disappear. A Christian can be needy, but we should not always be needy. A Christian should always try to, at times, should be able to find haven in the strength of others, but should not always have to live based upon the strength of others. One of the things that I'm doing here right now, my wife would rebuke me for, is there's so much in this text, I want to say everything. But the primary purpose here is to say that Jesus was gentle. And that gentleness was proven by the fact that the weakest and the most weary came to him. Young people, let me tell you something. You have a unique opportunity because you're in grade school and high school. Now, let me share with you something about that. Some of the cruelest people on the face of the earth are in grade school and high school. That's true. Now, some of you have either been victims of those cruel people or you've been the cruel people yourself. The thing about it is, in every one of your classes, there are certain children that no one else plays with. They make fun of the clothes they wear and everything else. And they're isolated and left out and hurt and broken. And they don't even want to go to school because of everything that happens to them. You know what? You could be a haven for them. You could reach out to them. You could prove what the master says here. You could be gentle and kind. And those people would find rest in your Christ likeness. You see what I'm saying? Tell you what, when you look at this stuff and start applying it, it's really amazing. Now, another thing that I want to say about the gentleness of our Lord in verse 18 of chapter 12. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Here we would think the great captain of the host has come in the name of the Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do a great work of justice. Then he goes on in verse 19. It's not battle array that he has placed upon himself. It's a mantle of humility and gentleness because it says he will not quarrel, no cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off 
and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope the most ungodly pagan peoples of the planet will learn to hope in this mighty one of God. But here is here's the text that I want us to see in verse 20. A battered reed he will not break off. It's amazing that the Puritans actually spoke much of this text. There's even a, a book on it. Let me just share with you what he's saying. Talking about our Lord Jesus, he said, a battered reed he will not break off. Now, in Israel, the children would sometimes go down to the river and get a reed because you can do so many things with a reed. But primarily, you can whittle one out, and put some holes in it and make a fine flute out of a reed. But there's a there's a, there's a thing about a reed that's very, very difficult. It's a very fragile thing. And in the hands of children, well, you start working on that reed for a few minutes, it breaks in your hands. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to spend the whole day trying to mend this thing? Of course not. Throw it away. Why not? Why not throw it away? I mean, there's, there's billions of more reeds in the river from which we can make our musical instruments. We don't need this thing. It's broke. It's cracked. It's worthless. Throw it away. Get another. That's not what Jesus does. He begins to work in the life of a person, young person, man, woman, child, begins a good work in them along the way. That work becomes cracked, broken, chipped. It appears to everyone else that it's useless. We're so quick to throw people away, aren't we? But Jesus comes and he takes that cracked, broken piece of reed that can, you can't even use it to carry a tune. He takes that reed and begins to work again. You know, Satan is not only the accuser of the brethren, primarily is the accuser of God. I can imagine Satan to Jesus just working. What are you working with that thing for? It's already proven to be flawed. It's useless. Go get something else. Christ just continues to work. And then before you know it, he takes that thing and puts it back to his mouth and plays music. A greater music than the flute could have ever played before. They say to make an opera singer a good one, you have to break their heart. For someone to sing with passion, you have to break their heart in love. I believe that. It's only broken things that play the sweetest music. Because everyone recognizes they were broken and broken by their own doing. But God came and fixed them and therefore the Creator gets that much more glory for Himself. And after all, that's what it's about anyways, isn't it? And then He says, in a smoldering wick, He will not put out. Now in Peru, in places where I lived, we used lamps. And even as a little boy, I can remember in, in the terrible winters we might have there in Illinois, sometimes electricity lines would go down and we would be all around the fire and we'd use kerosene lamps. Now, there's something that young people don't understand about a kerosene lamp. When a kerosene lamp is filled with oil, there will be a flame on the wick, but the wick will not burn. It will not consume itself. But when the oil is gone from the container, the wick begins to burn. And when the wick begins to burn, it is the most wretched thing you have ever smelled in your life. And someone walking in from a day out of the house, working in the fields in Israel, comes back and finds the lamp. The oil is burned out of it. The wick is burning, sinking up the whole house. The only thing they're going to do is take that fragile vessel. They're going to grab it and pitch it right out the window into the heap. Why? Well, it's ruined everything. It's stunk up the house. It's, it's horrible. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. In his gentleness, he comes back, he takes the wick, he cuts off that which is charred. He mends the vessel and then fills it again with the oil of his spirit and it burns brighter than ever before. 
These are some of just some of the illustrations of what it means to be gentle. To be gentle. And he says, back to chapter 5, he said, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. And as I said, there's so much in this text that makes me want to run rabbits, but some of you are so trying to inherit the earth now and you're not waiting upon the Lord. And the way this earth is at this present moment, you really don't want much of it. It is time to live for the Lord with all your heart and soul, mind and strength and await an earth that will be recreated by the power of God. Incorruptible. A beauty so great that if you were to catch a vision of it, you would go mad. The gentle will inherit the earth, not the movers and the shakers. Not itinerant preachers. Not people who cast out demons and prophesy in his name and perform many miracles, but the gentle shall inherit the earth. The Puritans would use this text to determine whether or not a church member was even saved. Because they would warn the church member, if these characteristics are not in your life to some degree, you need to worry about the condition of your soul. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. How can I do justice to a text like this? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, we're always thinking of us being right. And they're, they're, that's there. But I want you to think outside of the box for a moment. When you think about righteousness, they hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. They hunger and thirst for God to be vindicated. They hunger and thirst for God's will to be done on the earth, for God's kingdom to come. They hunger and thirst for every creature on the face of the earth to fall down in adoring worship. They hunger for God to get all the glory that God deserves. You see, when we look at text, it's always man-centered, isn't it? They hunger for God's righteousness to prevail and for God to be vindicated and honored above all so-called gods. They hunger and thirst for that. And then they hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God in their own life through Jesus Christ. There are so many today who hunger and thirst for a type of righteousness. They're very zealous towards it, but it's not according to knowledge. And they are twofold sons of hell. They do all sorts of things in order to make themselves righteous so that they might be acceptable before a holy God, proving that they neither understand holiness or righteousness. When you and I hunger and thirst for righteousness in our own lives, it's primarily, as the Apostle Paul said, to be found in him, to be found in him, to be trusting in no one, no other thing but him. I always go back to the Puritans because I like the Puritans. I don't agree with everything they say, but I I like them. They spoke much when they talked about repentance. Now they would say something that's quite unusual. It's found in Hebrews, but it kind of catches us off guard. You've heard of repenting from dead works. They would say repenting from good works. Now, what do they mean by that? Repenting from any trust in any work even that which might be a moral work, to gain some standing before God. Yes, my friend. You don't realize it, but many do that. Many sincere Christians. They have accepted the righteousness of God in Christ. They have believed in Christ. If you talk to them, they'll tell you, and they are sincere. Truly, they are believing in Christ alone, and they truly are saved. But in the practical working out of their salvation, they are still trying to find some position before God based on their own good works or performance. Instead of resting in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. You say, well, Brother Paul... You know, you're basically telling people to stop doing good things and just rest in Christ. No, my friend, if you're truly resting in Christ, you will be more like Christ than anyone with a moral agenda. You see, a carnal lost church member will hear these things and say, well, let's go sin. A 
Christian will hear these things and say, if grace is this way, let us follow the master. Let us be holy. Now, hunger and thirst for righteousness also means. A hunger and thirst in our personal lives to be more like Jesus. My dear friend, one of the problems that I see in, in much in, in some reformed theology is this idea that the law is the supreme example of God's righteousness. And that if we want to be righteous, we need to conform to the law. And some people will say, you know, on Judgment Day, the unbeliever will sit there on one side of the scale and the law be placed in the other and he will be weighed. That is not true. Let me tell you how it's going to work. The unbeliever will be placed on the side of that scale and Jesus Christ will be placed on the other side. The extreme, the maximum, the ultimate example of true righteousness and holiness is embodied in a person now. Not just Ten Commandments, but in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why when we go to terms like holiness and righteousness, we identify those and we determine what they mean within the context of who is this person? Who is this Jesus? It's all about Jesus. Now, we do not throw out the law. We simply say that Christ is greater than even the law. Christ is our supreme example, because I want you to know you can cross every T and dot every I of that law and be nothing more than a lost, hellbound Pharisee. We ought to hunger and thirst to be like Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Some of you possibly have heard of T.W. Hunt, um, a great uh, man of prayer, has written many books. He was a professor of mine and kind of a, uh, I considered him a, a mentor in a way in some things and would go into his office and talk to him and just just amazing man of prayer. And I walked in one day in his office looking like something the dog had just drug in. And I'm just walking in kind of like that seminary student I told you about this morning. You know, I'm so unholy. I'm so ignorant. And I, I walked in and he said, T.W. Hunt would always go like this when he'd look at me. He'd go. Paul, what is it now? And I said, Dr. Hunt, I am so unholy. I am so unrighteous. I desire to be like Jesus. I desire to my heart to be pure. I desire to just be holy. Oh, I just I, I'm just not content. I'm just miserable. I... And he's looking at me like this. And then all of a sudden, again, he went. And he stood up and he walked over to where I was seated. He put both hands on my shoulders and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pronounce you blessed. And he turned around, sat back down. And I, I looked at him and he said, Paul, you don't understand what I just did. I said, no, Dr. Hunt, I don't understand what you just did. Paul, have you never read? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Paul, you walk into my office. You're not content about anything in your life. The only thing you want is to be more like Jesus. You want to be more righteous. You want to be more holy. You want to be more pleasing. He said, boy, he said, listen to me. You are blessed. He said, if you walked in here content about your spiritual state, it might be evidence that you're lost. Now, here's the point, church. Many of the works of God in your life, Satan is twisting around to make you condemned. You sit there and you go, I'm just not as holy as I want to be. I'm just not as righteous as I want to be. I want to know his word in a greater way. I want to be more like him. And then you hear the voice of Satan. Yes, you're not like him at all. Condemnation, condemnation. And you don't recognize that the words out of your mouth is not a pronunciation or a pronouncement of condemnation, but one of blessedness. Those of you who are content with your spiritual state ought to fear condemnation. But those of you who seek to be more like him ought to worship God because he has done a true work in you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now listen, for they shall be satisfied on all accounts. Dear flock. God will vindicate himself. He has done it in the cross. And he will do it in the glorious appearing of the one who died. 
God's righteousness will prevail. His will will be done. His kingdom will come. Whether this church participates in the work or not. To his righteousness, you'll be satisfied if you're hoping for God to come back and prevail. You will be satisfied. Take heart. No matter how beaten down the truth is, no matter how much you see the truth twisted on television by heretics who preach in the name of Jesus, no matter what, you are going to see a day when you will stand there in the flesh and God will be vindicated before all men and all men will bow before him and his truth will be proclaimed and honored. Count on it. It's going to happen. And being found in Christ. Oh, my dear friend. He could have made you righteous like the angels. And that would have been enough. But he did not do such a limited work. The righteousness of God in Christ. That is why in that room, that holy of holies, where the presence of God dwells in its fullness, those mighty beings that could destroy the earth with a glance from their eyes, they bow their head and cannot look into the face of God. And yet you will play among the folds of his robe. You will enter in where angels cannot because you bear not the righteousness of angels, but the righteousness of God in Christ. You will be satisfied. You will stand there one day. You will be righteous. Found righteous. Declared righteous. Not only that, my dear friend, you will be righteous. At this point, I can say this theologically. There's not a righteous person in this room. What do I mean by that? We all still sin. We're subject to sin. So in that sense, we are not righteous. When the Bible talks us talks about us being justified or being made righteous, it's talking about a forensic legal declaration based upon the work of God in Jesus Christ. You and I have been declared righteous because Christ, when he died, he satisfied the justice of God and appeased the wrath of God. You and I have been declared righteous. That is true. But one day you will be righteous. I try once a year to read the Chronicles of Narnia. I know it's a children's kind of book, but you need to read them because you never want to stop being a child. When they come to the final great war. And then the renovation of all things and Aslan, who represents Christ, comes and leads his people into the land of his father. Yelling to them, higher up, further in, because the higher up and the further you go into heaven, the bigger it gets. And they're all running wildly. That's what you do in heaven. They were running wildly, passionately. And they come to this tree and one of them says, I've never seen anything like this before. And the fruit on it. Oh, how I would give anything to take from. I so desire to eat from that fruit. And they said, well, do you suppose this is prohibited? And a statement is made that is brilliant. One says, I think we finally come to a place where nothing is prohibited. Where no desire that we have will be taken away. And why is that? Because you will be perfectly righteous in the kingdom of your father. You will be perfectly righteous and every desire of your heart will be a righteous desire and therefore every desire of your heart will be filled. That's a wonderful thing. Truly a wonderful thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Now I want to finish with seven. I've gone on a little bit too long, but It wouldn't be appropriate to stop without touching this. If ever there was a passage or a verse of Scripture that proves that Christians are still not perfected and must still battle with the flesh, this is it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, what do I mean? How could it be That people like ourselves 
who crucified the Lord of glory, who took God's son and nailed him on a tree over a garbage dump and then received mercy. How could a people like us who has received so much mercy ever need to be reminded that we're supposed to be merciful? You talk about flagrant, horrifying hypocrisy is when someone stands up and just revels in the mercy of God and then cannot extend that same mercy to someone else. Well, you just don't know what they did to me. I don't need to know. That's never the issue. I'll never forget in the church I was in, I was kind of known as, you know, the very strict and, and all sorts of things, always preaching on holiness and righteousness. And one day a person who had committed horrendous atrocities came forward weeping. And you could just see the congregation just cringe. And I went and talked to them. And they broke down even more and were crying and threw themselves down in the front of the church and weeping. Walked over there. I held them. I talked to them. I got a call later on. How could you even think about forgiving that person? We know they're a hypocrite. We know they've done this. We know they've done that. How could you embrace that? How could you do that? And I said, if there is no hope for that person, then I go to hell too. Then I go to hell too. I have to. Because if there's no mercy for them, there's no mercy for me. How many sins did Adam and Eve commit before they were cast out of the presence of God? One, picking a fruit. Yet my sins could not be added up on the greatest calculator. The greatest computer. Only in the books of God, the extent of my sin is known. You see, it's just a question of who has sinned, not who has sinned more. Because once you've sinned, there's no other category. We as a people should always proclaim truth. We should never back down on truth. Never. We should always receive in mercy those who are broken. If not, we'll find ourselves broken and have no one in whom we can find shelter. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, does this mean that if we're not merciful, God, we're going to lose our salvation? What does this mean? It is teaching us basically that the primary characteristic of true conversion, true Christianity is mercy. If I have truly experienced the salvation of God, if I have truly experienced conversion, if I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if I have seen that he has spilled, shed his own blood for my soul. If my sins have been laid out before the divine panel and I've been pardoned in the name of Jesus Christ, then I must forgive. I must show mercy. I must help. My dear friends, there's enough destroyers in the world. You don't need another one. And prophets, those of you who are prophets, if you're not carrying a basin and a towel and a bomb, then don't call yourself a prophet. Jesus was dangerous to some, harmless to others, merciful to all who sought mercy, merciful to all. Now, church. God will be faithful to you. Upon that one thing, you can count. Now, let me ask you a question that will determine your spiritual maturity. Do you need anything else? No. God will be faithful to you. 
And God will be faithful to the man who has left here. God will be faithful to all His people. And He will finish a perfect work in every one. And on that great day, we'll stand there and be found in Him. Let's pray. Father, please help. Please help Your people. Strengthen them. Help your servant and strengthen him. Oh, dear God, you are much bigger than all of us. I pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. In the